Wormwood. I had of course noticed the temporary lull in political unrest surrounding your patient, and I'm not surprised in a corresponding lull in the patient's levels of anxiety. Do we want to encourage this, or to keep him worried? Both tortured fear and stupid confidence are very desirable states of mind. Our choice between them opens some interesting questions. The humans live in time, but our enemy destines them for eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to primarily think about two things, eternity itself, and that moment which they call the present. For the present is the moment of time which touches eternity. Of the present moment, and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to that which our enemy has of all of reality. In it only are freedom and actuality offered them. He therefore wishes them to either think about eternity, that is, to be thinking about him, or to spend their time in the present. Always meditating on their eternal union with, or separation from, himself, or listening to the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, or experiencing the present pleasure. Our business is to get them away from the eternity, and from the present. With this in view, we sometimes tempt a person, say a widow or scholar, to live in the past. This is of limited value, because they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature that makes it somewhat like eternity. It is far better to make them live in the future. Biological necessity points all their passions in that direction already, so that thoughts of the future inflame both hope and fear. And it is completely unknown to them, so that by making them think of the future, we cause them to think of unrealities. In short, the future is the part of time which is most unlike eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time. For the past is frozen and no longer flows, and the present is all lit up with eternal rays. This explains the encouragement we have given to all schemes of thought, such as creative evolution, scientific humanism, and communism. These fix people's affections on the future, on the very core of temporality. Nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present, but fear, avarice, lust, and ambition all look to the future. Do not think lust an exception. When the present pleasure arrives, the sin, which is our interest in it, is already past. The pleasure is just the part we regret, and would do without if we could without losing the sin. It is the part contributed by the enemy, and as such is experienced in a present. The sin, which we contributed, looked forward. To be sure, the enemy wants people to think of the future too, but only so much as is necessary for now planning the acts of justice or kindness which will probably be their duty there. The duty of planning tomorrow's work is today's duty. Its material is borrowed from the future, but this duty, like all duties, is in the present. I'm not splitting hairs. He does not want people to give their hearts to the future, to place their treasure in it. We do. His ideal person could spend all day working for the good of posterity, if that's their vocation, and then come home and wash their mind thoroughly of it, commit it to heaven, and return at once to the patience and gratitude demanded by the current moment which is passing over them. But we want a human hag ridden by the future, constantly haunted by visions of an imminent heaven or hell on earth, ready to break the enemy's commands in the present if we make them think that they can by doing so have the one or avert the other, dependent for their faith on the success of schemes that they will not live to see. We want a whole race in perpetual pursuit of the rainbow's end, never kind or honest or happy now, but using as mere fuel on the altar of the future all gifts which are offered to them in the present. It follows then, in general and other things being equal, that it is much better for your man to be filled with anxiety or hope, it doesn't much matter which, than to be living in the present. Now, the phrase living in the present is a bit ambiguous. It may describe a process which is as much concerned with the future as anxiety itself. Your man may be unconcerned by the future, not because he's living in the present, but because he's convinced himself that the future is going to be agreeable. So long as that is the true cause of his tranquility, his tranquility will do us good. For he is piling up for himself more disappointment, and therefore more impatience, when his false hopes are dashed. If, on the other hand, he is aware that horrors may await him, and is praying for the virtues with which to meet them, and meanwhile is concerning himself with the present because that is where all duty, knowledge, grace, and pleasure dwell, then his state is very undesirable, and should be attacked at once. Here again, our linguistic arm has been very useful. Try the word complacency on him. But of course, it is most likely that he is living in the present for none of these reasons, and that he is simply enjoying good health in his work. In that case, the phenomenon is nearly natural. All the same, I would break it up if I were you. A merely natural phenomenon is not necessarily in our favor. And anyway, why should the creature be happy? <laughs>